Today is a different kind of episode. Get ready to dive into the extraordinary world of Professor George Wajakoya. This is me. Bro, this is uh, swag, um, man. And that's why I, I respect, see. I respect, I respect. <laughs> Known for his eccentricities and unorthodox approach, Wajakoya made headlines in last year's campaign, capturing the attention of the media and the public alike. Despite running on a zero budget, he emerged as a formidable contender, securing an impressive third place finish. His manifesto sparked curiosity and controversy as he boldly championed the legalization of marijuana. Why, why did you feel like it was important to legalize weed? Because Kenya grows some of the best weed in the world. But behind the headlines and the buzz, there's a remarkable story that shaped this enigmatic figure. Grew up in uh, the streets of Nairobi. His journey is a testament to resilience, determination, and a unique perspective on government. How do we go about trying to get rid of poverty? Wait until I become the president, then you'll ask me that question. Today, I get the privilege of sitting down with the professor and we talk all things Kenya. Stay tuned. Welcome to This Food Bangs, guys. Today, it's a, it's a special day. It's a different type of episode. Um, I am in the capital of Kenya. I'm in Nairobi, and I'm sitting next to the great Professor Wajakoya. Mm. Sir, nice to meet you. Thank, Thank you very much for mm. having me on. Um, listen, I'm, I'm, I've been watching the YouTube clips. Mm. I've been watching your stories. Mm -hmm. um, you are um, the, the, the people's champ, as, I, as they say. Um, well, just very briefly, just tell us a bit about yourself for those that don't know much about you, Professor. Mm, I'm a Kenya. Welcome to my, my office. This yeah. is Karen, the suburbs of uh, uh, great people, if we may say so, people mm. who work hard. Mm. <laughs> and this is my office. Um, my name, as you said, is uh, Wajakoya, Kenyan, uh, formerly Grew up in uh, the streets of Nairobi, brought up by the Asians in Hare Krishna. I followed the Asian, the Krishna teachings, which made me a vegetarian, mm. which made me to do, to do the right thing. Mm. And I, I became enlightened, and my mind has never uh, been the same. So from there, they took me to school. And then after that, I was adopted by a former minister who is now late, who paid part of my fees to Elevos. Then uh, I was a temporary teacher before I joined the Kenya police, where I started as a police constable mm. in 1984, mm. after Kenya Police College. Mm. And I worked in the streets of Nairobi, which I knew very well. Mm. Eventually, going back to earning a promotion by going back for a promotional course, mm. of which I became an inspector of police. Mm. And I worked in various police stations. Then I joined the intelligence community. Mm. And then uh, after that, a uh, minister was killed. I was put in charge of investigating the murder of that minister. And those around that minister were killed, jailed, maimed. I was detained. The American embassy helped me to flee the country. Mm. And I went to UK where I became a, um, a refugee. And I was a grave digger, security guard for many, many years. Mm. I have kids who are born in the UK, mm. my daughter, my son, another daughter, yeah. and uh, they, are both, they are both still in the UK. I, mm. le I, I went to law school in the UK, mm. went to various law schools, started practicing, and now here we are. Wow, your, your style. I'm very much interested in your style because you've got a lot of swag, man. I'm not even going to front. <laughs> just, this this guy's got swag, bro. This is just me, man. <laughs> Where, who, who inspired you? What, like, what yeah, inspired you to... Life inspired me. When I, went, when I left the UK, yeah. UK and went to the US, yeah. I started again life in the scratch and I saw how people were suffering and I said, no, mm. I will suffer with them. So I mm. joined to suffer with them. Mm. And that's the best thing that made me. Mm. Staying with the people down there right from the time when I was born. Mm the time into my adulthood mm. and I didn't see the other side of golf kind of yeah. philosophy I was like do I stay with the people down here where Martin Luther King was mm. Malcolm yes. X was yeah. Nelson Mandela mm. Gaddafi or mm. do I have to go to the extreme right to start playing golf ride them horses and then move around in limos that's right so I had to balance that's right 
So uh, when you see me here, mm. I had my own caricature. I created my I own me. I created my own me, mm. and I wanted people now to start deconstructing me. Mm. So when I created my caricature, I wanted them to look at me and then make their own opinion, and later on now to come to know the real character, who mm. is me now. So I had to come up like Mahatma Gandhi. Mm. He was a caricature according to the British when mm. he was studying in England, mm. became a barrister, because he was wearing in a particular unfashionable way to the Brits. Of course. They are not used to seeing a man walking in winter with mm. lean clothes or what have you. Yeah, yeah. So I created my own eh, style, man. I said, no, man. this is me. Bro, this is uh, swag, and, man. And that's why I, respect, see, I respect, I respect, I respect. And I that's respect. why you see in the streets in Nairobi here. Mm. Since independence, Kenya has been independent for 50 years. Mm. But they have, have never happened what has happened. They have a f massive following mm. within the world now. Mm. People have created my caricature. Mm. You see most of these matatus, motorbikes, they yeah. have my pictures and I'm like, whoa, I'm still alive, guys. Mm. Don't start mourning me yeah. before I die. So <laughs> it is They're memorializing you already. Yes, and like today you see me in a suit. <laughs> because a minister was arrested, mm. a former minister in mm. the interior. And I always like my T-shirt and what have you. Mm. So I was told, now come, come to court to represent this right. one. So I said, in court, them, in them courts you have to. So I went there and uh, that's why he phoned me this way. Yeah, yeah, otherwise, yeah. this is not me. This, <laughs> this is something else, but <laughs> what can we say? That's true, mm. that's true. Mm. Listen, I mean, you spoke about being in the streets and, um, you know, having to navigate your way through life. Mm -hmm. What made you get into politics? What was the thinking behind it before it actually happened. I want to actually get to know why. One of the things that made me to go into politics is fake religious leaders mm. whose job was supposed to transform society, mm -mm. guide society mm. with moral aptitude. Mm. But people in the church lie a lot, especially the so-called preachers. Mm. They came up with a business to start to pollute society by lying to the society, by telling society, when you are sick, you come, we pray for you, you go to heaven. Mm. Come on, for God's sake. Mm. So all those lies now are adopted by politicians. And mm. they knew that if they want to do something or to steal more, mm. is to go to the church and then tell the church who they are not. And I was supposed to, I was supposed to that right from the beginning. Mm. I saw people suffering and being lied to being promised the future. The future is for the young people. These people don't want to give up. Mandela just came up, he said, no, two times, one time, I'm gone. And he went. And then I saw African leaders adapting the Western style of leadership, becoming autocratic, becoming dictatorial. The suffering of the people in the streets, because I've suffered, if you check my shoes, my, my toes, when I was a security guard at Stonebridge, a house in Wembley. Big up, by the way. My ends. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I could walk in that, doing patrols four times, mm. then going to school the following day, and then seeing people suffering. And then racism in Britain also transformed me. Where black people in Britain were being discriminated upon, ethnic minorities were being looked down upon. And when I went to SOAS, School of Oriental and African Studies, to do my master's, is when I realized that, that there was a white lie White man lying to black people. White man trying to transform a black person by feeding him like chicken. White man trying to transform himself as a superior next to God. And I said, no, you can't lie to me. You have a fake smile. Mm. You smile with me to do what? So I rebelled. I became a rebellion. And uh, while in England, and I'm coming to your point, started a bit, I sympathized with the Trumps. Because when I became a, a refugee, I was put to go and stay with Trumps in Arlington House in Camden Town. And when I saw the, 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 the white people who were staying with me there, I was asking myself two questions. How comes that I've been put together with extreme poor white people who work with dogs, who beg at the, uh, the tube station, they sleep here? If they knew that I was a refugee, why couldn't they train me, treat me better than and put me somewhere where I could, they could also show me life? So that downgrading syndrome, where they downgraded me to live with the people with dogs in Arlington House, in the guest of saying that refugees are protected. And they left me on my own. 
So that was one side. The other side is poverty, policies from the West. Anything good comes from the North. World Bank, IMF, cheating institutions like World Bank, World Trade Organization, IMF coming up with the policies to transform an African man who is not non-aligned like India and Tanzania. And looking at Tanzania's socialism, it worked good for Tanzania, mm. and that's why we don't have tribalism in Tanzania. Mm. But, so I wanted to de redefine my te destiny by telling the West and those who had adopted Western life, this is not going to transform me in any way. We've been independent for how long? How comes you have a lot of corruption? In England, they call it sleaze. In America, they call it lobbying. Mm -hmm. In Kenya, in Africa, they call it corruption. Mm -hmm. So I became a Pan-African, mm -hmm. and uh, I joined a group of students at uh, SOAS, who are also agitating for independence mm -hmm. in their countries. And here we are. Some would argue that, I mean, you touched on educated. You need to be an educated uh, person to be in politics. Some would say that, you know, you haven't had much experience as a politician to lead the country into its better days, let's say. How would you feel about that? Mabutu was a president for how many years? Mm. 40 years? Mm. <laughs> we call that experience. Mm. He ruined Congo, yeah. DRC, with the Belgians coming in to mine everything from. Mm. Jomo Kenyatta was a president for how long? He had so much experience to loot Africa, mm. to empower his family into the riches that now the system is fighting. Mm. Moi had how many years? How many, how many years did he rule as a president? 24 years. Mm. Is that what we call experience? Whereas uh, Thomas Sankara, the late Thomas Sankara, mm. only reigned for how long? Two, three months? Mm. Six months? And see how he transformed Burkina Faso. Mm. Look at Burkina Bay people. Didn't they kill him? When Mandela was in prison for so many years, when he came out, did he have experience as a strong cutter prisoner in prison or experience in politics? How comes that African talk of, people talk of experience? Ex what experience? Experience to eat? Experience to be corrupt? Or experience to be a good leader? It matters not how much experience is. I'm 60 something years old. I have been in the world. I am a lawyer of very high reputation. I've been in the UK. I've gone to sc them schools. I've gone to schools in the United States. I've had whatever. I don't need the experience to be corrupt. Mm. But if that's what people want, maybe on that line, no. But leadership, you're born a leader. Mm. If you are born a leader or if you agitate to fight for the rights of the people, you don't need experience. I've been in jail. Mm. I was detained. I have over 30-something years experience in exile. Was I reading stones there or eating stones? Mm. I was looking at how things are done. I was looking at a white man, mm. how he was treating a black man. And that's why in my PhD, my PhD today, I'm dealing with a with the uh, criminal justice and public policy mm. on immigration. How the rights of immigrants have now been uh, transformed into non-alienable rights. Mm. Because a white man today, uh, when a black person is arrested in the state of Maricopa today, Congress has passed legislation to allow immigration officers to commingle with local people just to address their issues by mm. arresting black people. So I want to find out through research why that legislation of 1996 Illegal Immigration Act was, was actually enacted. So it's not that you have to have experience in stealing in Africa mm. for you to rule. Well, I mean, in the previous uh, presidential camp campaign, your manifestos uh, got, got, got a, a lot of uh, sort of attention from the media. One of them were that, you know, you wanted to make weed legal in Kenya. Why, why did you feel like it was important to legalize weed? Israeli, in Israel they call weed kalamus. Mm. And even Jesus Christ used weed, traditionally through Judaism. If you read the books of Deuteronomy, Galatians, Numbers, you'll find out that the old Israelis, and the new Israelis have transformed weed into fiber industry where they manufacture armaments, they manufacture food, they have transformed the economy of Israel. What I was talking about was what can we get from fiber 
All these vehicles you see here, all these things you wear, this is fiber. I was looking into the commercial entrepreneurship mm. of what comes out of wheat. If you look at the DuPonts in the United States, you look at the cotton growers in the US, and fiber wheat growers, go and do research and find out why Congress had flawed the growth of marijuana in the United States. It was because one, it was available, it was cheap, it was productive, it was more expensive than cotton, and therefore it was more resourceful with the byproducts. I'm not talking of smoking, come on. Weed cures cancer, weed cures COVID, you can see what Pfeiffer has done with it. So I was looking in terms of medicinal and commercialization and industrialization. If you go to um, Taiwan, Taiwan now is one of the biggest producers and exporters of bricks. They're all made out of fiber, which is a byproduct of weed. Look at Canada last year. Canada's economy now is weed economy. I wanted weed to be legalized because Kenya grows some of the best weed in the world. Really? Yes. But one thing is that the weed thing is a, is a thing that the West will not want Africans to grow their own economy. The what? West will always want us to rely on them. Mm. Because if we had our own weed and we exported it on our own terms, Game over. we shall be richer and therefore the issue of dependence ratio will be absolutely not be there. And you can see countries are now legalizing. Zambia has legalized. Oh, really? Malawi, oh. whose president is actually a pastor from California, mm. is cutting off tobacco stems, replacing it with weed. Rwanda has now gone into uh, uh, an agreement with Israel to grow weed. China grew about 165,000 acres of weed. And the first harvest was almost 4 trillion US dollars. Mm. And they lent Kenya 1.5 trillion, which has built the superhighway here. Wow. So what is wrong with us? Must we wait for the developed countries to come up with some kind of convention mm. so that they can bring out the rules and now say this is legal, now we can transform ourselves into this kind of, and then any country that wants to uh, uh, grow it, they should sign the convention so that we are controlled from the West. No, this thing is available, man. We can grow it, process it, eh? have money on the table, transform our economy, and move on without importing stuff from West, most of it which is actually toxic, mm -hmm. a transformative economy. And right now, as I speak, a Nigerian presidential candidate, candidate currently, before the next uh, elections, has adopted my system, and the thing is gone wide in Nigeria. Why would we have to depend on the West all the time? Yet we have the, the, the raw materials here. Why can't we grow it and control it? Of course. Of course. Absolutely. And, and you, now let's touch on the issues of the, the new government. Um, obviously, sadly, you, 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 know, you didn't win uh, the general elections. Um, how, how do you feel about this government? And how do you feel like they're well, doing? Well, uh, the government has to be given time. Let's give the current president some time to mm. see whether he will come up because it's still too early for us to judge him. Because mm. if I was in his shoes, people would also be saying the same thing. Same thing, yeah. So let's give him a year or two mm. and see how he, he transforms the economy. But he has started off on the wrong footing, where he has come in as a person who is allergic to uh, reaction. Eh? Talks every day about his enemies. Talks every day about uh, what was done to him. Mandela came out of prison and he forgave everybody and he said, look, let us work as a team. This one has started dividing the people, that's number one. Number two, he's making sure that he takes all the, the poor, poverty-stricken opposition leaders and parliamentarians onto his side. Mm. And he's playing a very game, dangerous game mm. because for how long is he going to maintain these people? Mm. The economy, he, 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 he came up with a bizarre kind of... Uh, <laughs> promises to the Kenyan people. And he talked of transforming the economy within 100 days and uh, lowering the price of food. And, but things have just gone weird. Mm. Instead of bringing people together, working with the leaders like us together, he has come out with a policy of witch hunting. <laughs> He's making people afraid. He's taking us back to the dictatorship. 
Today, I was in court to represent a former Minister for Interior who was raided by the police last night just to settle scores with the president. Um, the president may, not, may only have one term. And I can see dictatorship reigning very soon. And today I was telling people, look, let him prepare and start manufacturing bullets because a lot of us are going to, to be there and he may lack bullets to kill us. Mm. So, I, uh, so what I'm trying to say in short is that uh, he started on the wrong footing, he's over borrowing. Within three months he has borrowed 500 billion. Mm. Yet he said he was not going to borrow. Why would you start borrowing and going around the world? Yet we have, well, yet if he had included us in his government, we would have advised him, look here, Your Excellency, look at this, look at uh, 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 the transformation of the economy from our local products, mm. rather than now saying we are going to, to import fertilizer and food, mm. yet our farmers have harvested maize, which is rotting. Of what, what is it? Is it uh, Bill Gates' agenda that he wants to bring to Africa? I've said no. So the thing is, let the president calm down. Let him come back to the people. Mm. Let him come back. We are willing mm. to work with him if he's willing to listen to us. But not coming with a heavy hand. Eh? You want to be a dictator, you'll die soon. <laughs> I recently uh, did a tour with Naim Nami kids they were their street kids of um, Nairobi and they actually uh, lead tours for tourists so they take the, the tourists into you know the, the, the their sort of world and show them how gritty their life was and the hardships that they faced um, when they were growing up and as I was walking through the, the poverty still there like and it, it saddened me a little bit because they were the lucky ones that sort of turned things around. But some, some of the kids that are there, they're still suffering. Um, and the environment that they're in is slowly harming them as well. It's toughening them up, of course, but it's harming them at the same time. How do we go about try, you know, trying to get rid of this poverty? Wait until I become the president, then you'll ask me that question. Mm. Mm. Right, right. Because, I mean, it's still there, you know, and it's, and it's sad to see that, you know, the, the kids are having to go wash themselves in a very polluted area, areas that aren't being taken care of. I was that kid some years ago. So wait until I become the president, or I get an opposition to advise, mm. then we shall have solutions. Right, yeah. right. Um, and I spoke to one of the, the leaders, the manager of the tour, and he was a street kid himself, just like you were um, when you were younger. Um, he's saying that now he's, he's had to take matters into his own hands and build his own school and help the, the kids, give them an outlet almost. And he said the government hasn't really helped. Uh, what I can say is like we have a school that we're running, we have a community wow. school that's that's taken incredible. care of. That's incredible. And uh, we're doing that because, uh, you know, even as someone took care of us, so we also feel that we have a big responsibility of taking care of, you know, other kids with it. Yeah, so we have that, that's like one of the projects that we have. And we are running, we have two schools that we are uh, working with. And um, there is one that we are looking forward to build it, hopefully this year, yeah. to build them like a permanent structure. Wow. And um, that's one. Another Thing is like, um, you said you're doing this all on your own, yeah. building the schools and everything, yeah? yeah. yeah. Any help from the government? Mm, I can't say like there is no help that we're getting from the government. Beside them uh, giving us training, like in those schools they're just like, you know, giving training to our teachers, but yeah. we're still taking charge of that because we have to pay for their transports wow. and also wow. pay for, wow. you know, like wow. there is a certain fee that they ask for. Uh, so they're just helping them to get used to the new yeah. curriculum, the CBC. So they could do more? Yeah, so they could do more. Yeah. Yeah. With the government, we're just hoping that maybe in future they will see the good. Yeah, they will, yeah, they will see and they will also, they need to come, you know, they, they need to come fast yeah. and uh, make education a priority. Like, uh, less talk and more action. That's right. Yeah. What can the government, this current government, do now to try and, you know, facilitate them? I think wait until I become the president, I have the solution. Mm. Yes. Any message you'd like to say to those that, that are still there, the street kids? Hope. Let them have hope. Um, 
I am actually working with a lot of them right now. Mm. Part of my salary goes to the street kids. It's not enough, but uh, we cannot just say let people bring in blankets or what have you. The main cause is bad and poor policies. Mm. So when I become the president, or when the current president can uh, accept for us to work together, mm. then we can collectively come up with solutions. We can ask ourselves, what do we do? Because you have plenty of land in this country. Yeah. You have plenty of infrastructure in this country. All you need is to transform those to be proper infrastructure. Mm. And everybody can get food on the table. Everybody can go in the so-called schools. But because of the bad governance and poor policies, mm. that's why, and corruption, that's why I wait. I said, wait until I become the president or somebody like me becomes the president. Come on. Probably that Come happen. on. Yeah. Come on. So you, does that mean you're going to be running in the next? I'm running. Not mm. that I'm going to. I'm running mm. and I'm going to be the next president mm. of this country. You, 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 I mean, the last campaign, mm. you ran it with zero budget. Nothing. Nothing. Yes, and one vehicle. One vehicle. And then there's another one there. And they never, those two vehicles never broke down. How People had choppers and everything. That's nuts. But I had God on my side and my ancestors on my side. And you could see, people are calling me and saying, hey, People are happy. People are escorting me. Yeah. yeah people are throwing food to me. Yeah. People threw, when I went to Ruiru, I, I was in Ruiru, in Kiambu, Tika Road. And guys just threw money in my vehicle, saying, buy fuel and move on. Wow. And you can see even today, yesterday I was in Kitengela. Small kids just stood and when they saw me, they, they, they formed a song. Right. And they started singing me, if you don't mind. I saw, yeah, yeah, yeah. I saw, I saw, I saw it on your status. Yes. And so, you were giving them high five when yes, they were in their yes. mitatus. And schools have become crazy in the country. But there's some lunatics, some mm. political lunatics here. Mm. Members of parliament. Yeah. Who think that I'm giving these kids weed. I've never smoked. Yeah. I've never smoked, I've never mm. eaten meat, mm. but you can see the lunacy mm. of the uneducated politicians mm. in this country who look at me as a threat. Mm. Stupid people. That's why sometimes I call them stupid. Listen, thank you very much for uh, doing this interview with me. <laughs> Professor, thank you very much for your time. Thank okay, you. Thank, thank you. you.